Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcasts, and Killer Podcast presents Who Killed, a podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. And I keep meeting people from Long Island. The first thing we talk about, if we're around the same age, is so, remember Ricky Casso? Sure do. A Long Island, New York couple said today that it was the devil, drugs, and rock and roll that led their son to ritual murder. Satanism, Judas Priest, give me a break, right? 17 year old Richard Casso was accused of murdering another 17 year old, Gary Lowers, in what police called a sacrificial killing. Nobody messes with the acid king. They claimed he was high on mescaline when he was arrested. The wall between fantasy and reality is slowly going to like start to like fade, you know. Police believe that members of a devil worship cult, the Knights of the Black Circle, took Lowers to a wooded area in Northport, New York. They just dragged a kid into the woods here at Northport. Casso and a group of friends performed a bizarre ritual, stabbing Lauer, burning articles of his clothing, and cutting out his eyes. What the fuck is going on in the suburbs, man? Casso would accuse Lowers of stealing drugs. Angel dust was stolen and like it became this contentious thing. It wasn't like 50 hits of acid, it was like angel dust and the guy was like fucked up out of his mind. Well, drugs played an important part in young Casso's life and so apparently did the devil. That was the golden age of Satan. In the park where the group congregated, there was Satanistic graffiti. Well, they would build a fire and sit around the fire and, uh, and take an animal, a dog usually, and uh, torture it to death. In the town I grew up in, we would not have had those kids. Richard Casso was awaiting trial on a charge of opening a 19th century grave. He needed a skull for this ritual he was going to do. Long Island in the 80s was a pretty weird place. Satanism provided the method for the murder, if not the motive. Neighbors are scared that these devil worshippers may take their team next. I mean, the 80s were fucking stupid, man. It was as though the devil was an actual entity hanging out at the 7-Eleven on the corner, hanging out in some kids' rooms. Ricky, like, wasn't, like, in a cultist. He just, like, you know, carried around this satanic Bible. He couldn't even spell Satan right. Richard Casso was a dropout, a drifter, and a drug user and dealer. I can understand Richard Allen Casso. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Who Killed? I am once again joined by the best-selling author, Jesse Pollock. And we're here to talk about the satanic panic of the 1980s, but not just the panic itself. We're going to actually talk about one specific case, and that is the case of Ricky Casso. And Jesse has some deep knowledge on this case as he has written a book about it and also done a documentary about this case. So, Jesse, welcome back to Who Killed? Thanks so much, Bill. Happy to be here. Awesome, man. So basically, as we've known, anybody in the true crime world knows about the 1980s and sort of the satanic panic. But you know a little bit more than everybody else about this case because you were dealing with it for a number of years so what was the environment like and what was the temperature like in regards to Satanism and this whole sort of convoluted panic that was created in the late 70s and early 1980s? Well, it, it had its roots in the late 60s and early 70s going back. Um, you know, a lot of people start to think of bands like uh, Ozzy, you know, Black Sabbath, Motley Crue and all that when, you know, they're talking about the satanic panic. But you go back even further, like there were rumblings of it with people like Alice Cooper, etc., and the big turning point um, that scholars seem to agree on is the release of The Exorcist in what was that, 73 or 74 when the film came out like that really started to kick off a pop culture wave of a sincere fear of Satan as an entity that hadn't been seen in at least American culture in quite a while by that point, several decades. You know, um, the weird thing about the 60s that a lot of people kind of forget about is, yes, there was this whole youth subculture, but it also kind of like branched out from the anti-authoritarian hippie subset 
into what was quasi affectionately known as the Jesus freaks in the late sixties and early seventies. And it was people that had kind of tried the drug thing out in hate Ashbury or, you know, tried doing the, the whole psychedelic trip and it wasn't for them. So the church really kind of seized upon it as, well, Hey, you're, you're looking for meaning in life in these changing times. You know, who else was uh, a pretty cool dude with long hair and a beard and sandals, a little guy named Jesus. You see that on, so, you see that on billboards these days. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was that? Super Bowl? It was like, oh. it's like he washed feet and it's like, is this, is this Tarantino's new joint? What's going hey, on? Man, $7 million spent for uh, advertising when you could have been spending it on homeless people and actually taking care yeah, of those kids don't need to eat tonight. We got to get Jesus next to Taylor Swift. Absolutely. Oh boy. Can't wait for the hate mail. I'm going to get for yeah. that, but um, no, <laughs> fuck it. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it was this whole period that was sort of setting the stage for the, the early to mid 70s to really explode with this exploration of satanic cults are real. They worship the devil as a true entity and they're coming to kill your kids, either possess them or just straight up murder them. And we we saw uh, the first wave on the East Coast of that with uh, the Ginetta Palma case in 1972 in New Jersey, which was the subject of my first book, Death on the Devil's Teeth. That was a big watershed case out there that had people completely convinced that there was a satanic cult. Well, there, there, there were two schools of thought on it, neither of which were true, of course, but there, you had one sect of people in the area saying, oh, it was a satanic cult. They meet in the woods of the Wachung Reservation and they kidnapped this hitchhiking teenager and murdered her on an altar. The other sect said, oh, no, I heard it was a coven of witches and it, it, it was just all from people that were, you know, consuming popular media at the time that was honestly almost like whether it intended to be or not, almost like thinly veiled propaganda for the church. And we're seeing that all over again with the glorification of the Warrens, who, if you do enough research into them, it's very clear that they were fraudsters and Ed Warren was a, a colossal piece of shit. But. You know, the Conjuring universe now has, again, uh, mythologized them into like these heroes of the paranormal research world. But, you know, in reality, those films are, are pretty much Christian propaganda that, you know, prayer can stop these entities and these hauntings and, you know, this violent poltergeist activity, etc. But, you know, all of that goes back to The Exorcist. So... Again, the stage was set like firmly by the 1980s for some some case to come along and really kick these things up. And the Casso case was arguably the biggest one, which is oh, I hit my microphone off to edit that out. Um, and arguably the Casso case is the biggest one, which is kind of fascinating because within like a year of that case being resolved it kind of took a backseat to other sort of lesser satanic panic cases like you had the judas priest uh judas priest suicides and of course while that was awful and completely horrible it wasn't the same as oh no there was this murder in the woods that supposedly a cult was behind like when Ricky Casso was arrested for killing his friend Gary Lowers and put on the front page of every major newspaper in the country, it was validation for people who had been buying into the propaganda of the satanic panic for nearly a decade by that point, maybe even over a decade, depending on what media they consumed. You know, it was validation in the form of, see, I told you this rock music, it's bad for kids. It makes you pray to Satan and it turns you into a killer. Look at this guy that they just arrested out on Long Island with the ACDC shirt. So it, it was a very, very scary time. It was almost a new witch hunt in American society. Yeah, I mean, it really does harken back to the Salem witch trials, which we obviously have come to know a little bit more information or a lot more information about that case and what the roots of that particular 
uh, event might have been. But uh, yeah, you know, the, you think about the era of the Salem witch trials and then fast forward a few centuries and we're back to where we were. And now, like what you were saying, you know, before in the 80s, now we're right back there. The, the cycle is becoming shorter. <laughs> Yeah, and it's all for the same reasons, too. It all goes back to the concept of the other. You know, if there's someone or some group of people that American society has, you know, or at least a sizable portion of American society has decided we don't like them, we don't like what they're doing, they will exaggerate it and cast it in a literal demonic light. Like, And you see it all over the place now. I mean, obviously these people are wing nuts, but enough people take them seriously where you know people say, well, the Super Bowl halftime show, it was a satanic ritual and you know uh, I'm not even going to get into no, all these rumors because ridiculous. they're so stupid. It, it's ridiculous and you know, like you said, some people buy into this stuff and it it takes somebody like whatever the dude's name, which we don't even need to bring up, but the guy went into the pizza shop and shot off a few browns from his AR-15 because he was under the impression that there were sex trafficking in the basement, which didn't even have a basement. And it's mm-hmm. like, okay, Pizzagate is uh, some crazy ass uh, satanic slash Christian, uh, you know, hoax. I mean, it's just another one of those QAnon conspiracies that we've talked about before. And yeah, it does a huge disservice to this country. And for the people that do buy into it, God help them because they... <laughs> Oh, the, you know, they go down <clears throat> a path that they just can't uh, seem to get off of. No, and, and it's really unfortunate. And again, you really have to blame popular media for a lot of it, which is a really uncomfortable position for me to uh, take because, you know, I'm, I'm part of media as a journalist and an author and as a filmmaker. So I have my own sort of, I guess, cross to bear, for lack of a better term, for stuff like this. But I mean, like I said, it usually comes down to a catalyst of a film in a decade where we see these, you know, temporary bursts of high public interest in satanic conspiracy theories. Like in the 70s, it was The Exorcist. And in the 80s, it was um, I think they were blaming films like Friday the 13th for for teenage violence and all that and saying that those films made you worship the devil. And of course, you know, all of the Ozzy albums, I think the church even got all up in arms about the thriller music video, if I remember correctly. And in the 90s, which we have seen the longest staying power, unfortunately, with the advent of the Internet was Oliver Stone's JFK. Uh-huh. Now. I, th- that's no slight towards Stone as a filmmaker. As a film, JFK is is a masterpiece. The editing alone on that is groundbreaking. And as a story, it's it's incredible. But as history, it's god awful. I mean, whether you believe in conspiracy theories with JFK or not, there are at least one website chronicled this. There are over one hundred provable factual inaccuracies and distortions in that film. But because Stone is such a a masterful filmmaker and it there was this sort of um air of credibility that was lent to that film through the um the uh the jfk records act that was passed in the wake of his film coming out it bred this culture which again was amplified by the internet of nothing you see and read is true. There are darker forces at play. You're being lied to, you know, well, all of Illuminati. this Illuminati. Yeah, Illuminati, the CIA. And look, you know, of course the CIA does shady shit, but, you know, these people, they look under a rock and they'll find a conspiracy there. And I'm one of, I'm, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not one of these people that poo-poos all conspiracy theories. Like, I don't believe the official explanation of the JFK assassination. But, you know, once you start getting down the rabbit hole of some of these people that were like, uh, well, the medical evidence doesn't fit my, my own theory about what happened. So they must have done plastic surgery on JFK's body while they were flying on air force one back to Washington from Dallas. Like at that point I start tapping out when people are, are having to invent 
a lot of grand theories or scenarios to support their theories. Like I remember back when I was in high school, there was a photo of uh, President Bush at a Longhorns game, a uh, Longhorns game, and he was doing the hook 'em horns hand symbol. Mm-hmm. And while I was no fan of President Bush, you know, there were a lot of people that were like, see, this is proof that he's in league with Satan. He's giving the devil horns. And it's just like, come the fuck on. All right. You know, it's it's a football thing. It's like, uh, are we going to say all deaf people are in league with Satan because the horns is isn't it? I love you in American Sign Language is shit like that. It's if you if you're a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, when you're out there and you basically have a, a net that's looking for different conspiracies to catch on to, it's not very difficult these days with the Internet and with the proliferation of social media and the echo chambers that you can create for yourself. I mean, it's so simple and it's scary mm-hmm. because we have a lot of people that are completely misinformed on what's going on in the world. And it's not like we're going to sit here and tell you what to believe, but whatever you hear, it's generally not as bad as what (laughs) they're being portrayed as. And, uh, you know, I always go back to the movie network from the seventies where it's, uh, Mm -hmm. we're going to create the death hour. And, uh, yeah, basically if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, that's pretty much how news is now run but back there back then they were doing this as a farce and it's amazing how much that became the reality of what we see every night on the nightly news or whatever you know if depending and i ran into that in publishing as well one of the publishers that uh we first shopped uh death on the devil's teeth to all the way back in 2014 um they said to me under no uncertain terms they said we're not buying this book from you unless you can get us 36 graphic autopsy photos from this case and I'm really happy that they said that to me because it was like, okay, good. I know not to work with these people, but it was startling to hear that because it was, I'm not going to name them and cause anyone any trouble, but it was a very well-known publisher. It wasn't, you know, some little rinky dink vanity press. And, you know, when you get exposed to that, that early on with your first book, it really is eye opening to see how, Oh, it's not just the consumer's, who are frothing at the mouth for blood and gore. It's the the people in in the CEO's offices and the editorial offices that are determining product that are, you know, uh, frothing at the mouth for it too. So it, it, it was very disturbing to me and it just really cemented my desire to engage in any sort of true crime reporting with, you know, as much professionalism and compassion as possible. Yeah, the industry, I mean, we can look at, you know, I have a background, obviously, in, in news and journalism and, you know, worked for the affiliates, CBS and ABC in Cleveland. And, you know, the, you look at the stories that you cover and then you get to the good stories. And it's always like the last five minutes. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, OK, cool. Why don't we just have like a happy news instead of a, or like just give a happy spin instead of the fear mongering that you see these days? It's just well, because fear sells. It does. It, it absolutely does. Just like the satanic panic. I mean, who didn't take advantage of the satanic panic in the eighties? I mean, look at Geraldo. Look at Phil Donahue. I mean, he grew up four blocks away, two blocks away from where I grew up, and uh, you know he he bought into all this stuff. They it was ratings gold. Oh yeah. You just think, oh, we're gonna bring on some satanists, and then you have. Uh, you know, Geraldo, who, you know, he, that Geraldo special is such a gold mine for unironic humor. When Geraldo is, is trying to make Ozzy apologize for his lyrics. You no, know, you're getting it all wrong, man. It's, it's comical. It's like an SNL sketch. Yeah. Geraldo definitely in the eighties was a, uh, presence. Uh, he actually lives mm-hmm. in Cleveland now, which is ironic too. Um, oh, I'm gonna go see him. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we're gonna have words. Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I think he's apologized for some of that stuff actually uh, that he did because you know I know that there are a lot of families uh, like the Wetterlings when oh god you know, that she basically had said that she felt completely used by them and that goes for John mm. Walsh too and we know that they've done good things but it also when you have victims families like you said you got to be more professional 
and you have to bring a more air to it than what some of these others are doing where it's exploitation or it feels like that they may have good intentions but it comes off as whatever because maybe their producer or their director decided we're gonna add this little tidbit before we do the interview that sort of skews like the whole idea like Mm -hmm. oh yeah like uh you know this is the story of so and so and Satan and you know, it's like okay well now we've just <laughs> laid out the table and basically now we have to eat what you just laid out so that's it and you're going to leave thinking that Satan is somehow involved in whatever case that they're talking about yeah and it really goes to show and it's really saying something that how wild is it that the one person from that era that has kind of come out unscathed and for good reason is Robert Stack? Like, how the fuck is it that Unsolved Mysteries, which was, you know, it, it was a pure entertainment show, but did more good and were more responsible in their reporting of true crime cases and missing persons cases, etc., than 90% of the uh, mainstream media at the time it it, it is really it's shocking almost but um i think i don't know i mean good for stack though i fucking love that yeah and i think that you know i think we're kind of roughly around the same age so we grew up with that sort of that voice and the you know like it's just updates you know it's like yeah that show you know tonight's story <laughs> are these american corporations trying to sell you on a bunch of bullshit about satan to get your money <laughs> maybe you can help solve this mystery <laughs> it's like fuck yeah we're doing this together robert Stack. yeah we're gonna do it and then we're gonna watch matthew mcconaughey get shot <laughs> Dude, oh my god, when I saw that episode, I was like, holy shit, he's always been McConaughey, because that was his first role. Yeah. Like, he he's given, like, an Oscar-worthy <laughs> performance in that fucking episode. It's just like, this rules, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I mean, just, like, seriously does have a, I think, a long-standing, uh, it's kind of like, forensic files it's like Mm -hmm. first to the first to the gate and still one of the best i mean obviously we know that i'm talking about forensic files the original not forensic files too because the voice has passed away so unfortunately it's not the same show as it used to be but uh there i can't even i don't even know how many episodes they made of that but yeah between Forensic Files. Oh, hundreds, I think. I, Forensic Files was like one of the longest um, yeah, it was on in the 90s. lasting shows of that era. And that was like, I don't want to call it like the golden era of true crime because it wasn't like, I, I mean, most of it was pretty good. And as far as I know, a lot of it was really accurate. But it was it was also pretty fucking dark. Like some of those shows like Forensic Files and Cold Case Files. Oh, I loved like, Cold Case Files. They didn't hold back. No, American Justice with Bill Curtis American Justice with Bill, with Bill Curtis. Yes. <laughs> I worked with uh, Bill Applegate, who was his uh, general manager when he was in Chicago. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was like, what was Bill Curtis like? And he's like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you're, you're an awesome boss. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the insights. No, but all those those shows really did set a standard. They did. The um, high quality they, stuff. I mean, remember uh, City Confidential? That was great. FBI Files was also really mm-hmm. good. Yeah, FBI. You're right. Because I think I think one of the things that those shows really had going for them was they were too low budget to be uh, misleading. Like they didn't have the money to dress shit up. Right. So I think the only choice they had was, well, I guess we have to present an honest telling of this. Yeah, we, all Damn. we have here is the facts. <laughs> yeah, shit, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and we only have a certain amount of film. So mm-hmm. here we go. Uh, let's not screw this up. And, you know, I, yeah, I do believe that like – our generation was definitely shaped by those shows. And like you said, Robert Stack does come out pretty much unscathed. But, you know, who knows what he would have done? I mean, I guess he was pretty old by the time he passed away. So um, mm-hmm. he was heck. He was the untouchables. He was uh, he was a he was a different, uh, you know, he was a real good actor. You know, when Dennis Farina took over, it was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I like Dennis right, Farina was, a lot. But yeah, it was just it wasn't the right fit. Yeah, yeah. He would have been great for like FBI files because 
he was a cop. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he tried to cop up Unsolved Mysteries too much. Once he started talking about our crack squad, and it's like, I don't want to hear about your your squad of, of crack smokers, whatever the crack squad is. It's like, j- just g- give me the facts, man. Put a fucking trench coat on and stand in a poorly lit alley and scare the shit out of me. But I will say that I'm sure that there has got to be a few episodes of unsolved mysteries that delve into the satanic panic and uh, oh, the son of Sam two parter. <laughs> yeah. Because at the time everybody was, um, um, kissing the ground that Maury Terry walked on, but it was only because Maury Terry, you know, framed, you know, classic, you know, quote unquote, classic cases like Manson and son of Sam in a light that no one had really considered before. So it wasn't so much that, wow, this guy's research is so amazing that it had to be taken seriously. It was, oh, this bullshit book is selling a lot. I guess we have to interview the guy. And Maury Terry was just, you you know, I I never met the guy before he died. Um, I don't know anyone to my knowledge that knows him or worked with him. So I can't speak for him personally, but it's a real shame that like the best case scenario that you could apply to his work is, well, he was so easily duped that he just believed every bullshit story that someone told him about Manson. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. I mean, I think any author that is in that business, I think they're, it's sort of like what we were just talking about with the, um, you know, just trying to fit the square peg into a round hole and sometimes they'll shave off the sides to make it work. And in the process, Mm -hmm. they're basically miscuing the story or misconstruing the story. And that can lead to cases just never being solved because people have put these other thoughts into people's heads that they think it's one thing when it's really completely a 180 from what they're talking about. Yeah. And the, the new um, incarnation of unsolved mysteries on Netflix is, is getting some shit for that too. Like there was that one episode they did a, a year or two ago about the, um, the poor teenager that was killed by the train And if you go on Reddit and all these other forums that have people that have been independently researching those cases for years prior to the Unsolved Mystery segment, like they list in great detail. Here are all of the inconvenient facts, you know, inconvenient for the producers that were left out of this show. And when you read some of this stuff and it's hard not to feel duped. Like, oh, they're trying to get us, you know, to, to believe this, but it's at the expense of, well, we left out all of this important, you know, uh, circumstantial information that would have maybe weakened the point we were trying to make. And I don't know, I've I've always been really against that in journalism. Like, I understand that, like, when you're chronicling a case, you can't put every single thing that someone says about it in. Um, obviously, you have to do your own due, di- due diligence and try and weed out the quote unquote crazies. But if you're leaving out shit from the police report and shit from the families, like you are not doing your job as a true crime journalist. And I understand that unsolved mysteries should not be considered journalism, but the sad fact of the matter is the majority of America does. And all of those programs, because they have been conditioned by the media to believe, Oh, it's on TV. It must be true. This is a documentary, not a movie. It must all be true. But there are plenty of documentaries and television um, docu specials that engage in that sort of yellow journalism. I mean, I've been accused of it with uh, my own documentary that I co-directed with Dan Jones about the Casso case. There are some people out there that uh, just cannot let go of the idea that Ricky Casso was the leader of a satanic cult. So they accuse Dan and I of, oh, well, you know, they're skewing the story to their own predetermined, you know, point of view. And we, you know, uh, of course, there's no such thing as no bias in journalism, but we tried to be as objective as possible when presenting that story. And I'm sorry, when you've got 35 people on camera or being interviewed in your book, all agreeing, no, there was no satanic cult. Yeah, Ricky was into Satan, but it was on the, you know, he read spooky books and listened to Ozzy level. He wasn't like a cult leader. You kind of have to start going, well, maybe I need to give up this bullshit story that, 
there was a teenage cult of devil worshipers operating on Long Island in the 80s. Like it did not hold up to scrutiny. But some people who really love those stories, they just don't want to give them up. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely you see it with uh, reporters, you see it with writers, you see it with all sorts of different uh, individuals, investigators and stuff. And, you know, you have to take the investigators at their word sometimes, you know, it's one specific case that I cover, you know, they've been adamant that anybody in the media, it's not them. And mm. like, you got to read between the lines or just take them at their face value. Like they're saying, if it's been in the news, it's not that guy. So how can you not take that when you hear it from the special investigator and the chief, it's kind of hard not to just, accept that is the case and all these other people who are trying to put that, you know, certain suspect into certain places, it just doesn't necessarily always work. And again, mm -hmm. you have to go by what you've been told. And also you have to pick and choose on what you share. You know, it's not, uh, not to say that you're leaving things out to tell your story, but you're also trying to also protect the, case especially an unsolved case of you know in certain cases but mm -hmm. like with the casso case you know you were boots on the ground and you know it was a labor of love for for basically how many years did you work on the case three and a half wow yeah, and that's that's just counting the book. When when you count the uh, the documentary in, we didn't finish making that documentary and releasing it until 2021. So that's about six years that I worked on the the story itself altogether. And you have to, t I mean, when when you spend that much time working on something, you walk away with an opinion, and and I oh yeah, the thought of the or the idea that this was occult or this was cult related and the fact that he was wearing an ACDC t-shirt or like, you know, just somehow, some way, the whole, it's like the West Memphis three thing. It's just like, exactly. they basically just brand you a villain because of the way you look. Now, granted, mm -hmm. there's things about Casso. I mean, clearly he was a, you know, like the party kid and uh, do a lot of drugs and. Oh, he had issues. I mean, you know, he's no angel in the story. Of course, he killed Gary Lowers and brazenly led tours to the body for uh, two weeks. But it's you have to navigate it where you have to redeem a portion of his story that has been distorted solely for profit for four decades without trying to come off as um excusing his behavior like that was a really hard line to tell while i was working on the book in the film because you know once it's established okay he was not the leader of a cult the knights of the black circle were not a cult they were they were a group of drug dealers who gave themselves a spooky name because um rival drug dealers from east northport would come over to northport village and basically beat the shit out of them and steal their pot that they were selling <laughs> so they came up with this idea of oh, well maybe if we paint pentagrams on the back of our denim jackets and call ourselves the knights of the black circle people will think we're Satanists and they won't fuck with us anymore. And it worked. But unfortunately, <laughs> when a satanic quote unquote murder happened in the town, you know, it wasn't a huge surprise that people were trying to link them, you know, together. And, you know, Casso knew some of the guys that were in the Knights, but he was not in that group, let alone the leader. Those guys were all like four or five years older than him. They'd all graduated high school by that point. You know, he was not really involved with them, but the police basically took it as, oh, oh, so, so Casso was talking about Satan while, you know, he was out of his mind on PCP stabbing Gary Lowers to death. Didn't we have a problem with some Satan kids like four years ago in town? Yeah, he must have, he must have been involved with them. Put that in the press release. <laughs> so right off the bat, they're just, totally right in the line of yep this is where we think this is going and this is why we think this happened and it's satan related 
and yeah it was keystone cops the murder of gary lowers was i think the first murder that had happened in northport village in about 50 oh, years man so these were cops that were used to handing out parking tickets you know for you know 40 hours a week or whatever it was these were not seasoned you know, criminal profilers or crime scene technicians. I mean, you know, most of the heavy lifting in the investigation was the Suffolk County PD. And I mean, we've already talked about the issues with that department, which are incredibly long running. <laughs> but, you know, all of that early stuff with this case, the press release and all of that shit that came out of the Northport Village Police Department, which was not equipped in any way to handle a case of this magnitude, which is funny because when you talk about, quote unquote, a case of this magnitude, it's not like we're talking about the Lufthansa heist. It was essentially two kids killing each other in the woods over a drug debt. Casso killed Gary Lowers because Gary Lowers stole a bag of PCP out of his right. pocket while he was sleeping. You know, that's it. No more. No less. But because the guy was so dusted out of his mind while he did it and was screaming, say, I love you, Satan, while he was stabbing Gary to death, trying to terrify and, and intimidate him, you know, for these kind of, for lack of a better term, you know, bumpkin Mayberry cops, they saw that as, no, this is validation. It's proof. And Casso did not do himself any favors with that shit. It was only a few months before the murder happened that he was picked up by the police for trying to dig up a grave. Like <laughs> he was trying to steal a skull for what he in his drug addled mind w thought was, you know, a ritual. And I mean, it wasn't even his idea. It was this this weird, like homeless guy that they sort of hung out with in town. Um, his name was Pat Toussaint. Everybody called him Pat Pagan. And he was this like Vietnam vet that would basically creepily hang around with all these teenagers in the park downtown. You know, that sounds like such an eighties after school movie. <laughs> Type of. There are a lot of echoes of River's Edge in there, okay. and even though River's Edge was based on a different true crime case, I'm I, I do think the writers may have been aware of this one too and sort of peppered it in because it's very much uh, th this Pagan Pat character was very much like um, oh god, uh, Dennis Hopper mm. in River's Edge yep. it was that sort of thing, and you know he would get Librium from the VA hospital to help him with the DTs while you know drinking. And so he would sell that to teenagers and he would get, you know, pot and whatever off of them. But he was the one that came up with the idea to tell Casso, like, oh, yeah, we got to get a skull. We're, we're going to go to the Amityville Horror House on Walpurgis Noct and we're going to do a ritual to summon Satan. It's it's some, you know, fucked up veteran with, uh, you know, PTSD and a, a wet brain from years and years of alcohol abuse that is influencing this kid to do it. And, you know, th there's no two ways about it. Yes, he did try digging up a grave to get the skull and told the cops willingly that he did it. But that does not a cult leader make. You know what I mean? Mm. These are just fucked up, mentally ill people that are addicted to drugs. This was not an organized religious effort like the way uh will uh yeah wilco jeff tweedy he killed all those people in texas remember waco it, it wasn't like the branch davidians or you know um god what was that other fucked up one mother god or whatever did you see that hbo documentary? oh my lord that is that is uh i feel so yeah. awful for those families that uh believe that crap you know, mm -hmm. their the daughters believe that crap because they're they're insane. They are just straight yeah. up insane. And granted, you know, it is sort of like the Casa thing in that case where it is. Well, yeah, it's just a loosely organized group of, um, you know, mentally ill and drug and alcohol addicted people. But by the same token, they had the organization of, you know, renting these shared properties together. And they had, uh, you know, a bank account for the organization. They had PR people. So it was way more organized than these shit kicker kids doing PCP in the woods and listening to Ozzy. You know what I mean? Yeah, it would have been a zine so, scene back then. You know, like that's yeah. how you would have gotten your information. There was no internet. There was no way to communicate beyond your city. And with that being said, I wanted to ask you the question a little bit ago. How big is Northport? It's tiny. 
The the t Northport Village itself is only I want to say two miles in diameter, and in 1984, less than eight thousand people lived there. Wow. Okay. So it is. So you're you're not wrong when you say their police department would be completely unprepared for something along the lines of a murder, let alone a... I think the police department had less than a dozen employees uh, at the wow. time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, 8,000 people, they probably didn't have much funding. Did they ever turn it over to the FBI or do anything like beyond their own investigations? Or did this just get sort of like solved and then... Um, you know, they blamed well, other it on than the coordination with the Suffolk County Police Department. Um, they uh, to, my, to my recollection, because it's been a while since I, I wrote the book and worked on the documentary. I don't believe they brought any federal agencies in because there was no interstate aspect to what they had done. It was all kind of self-contained to Long Island. Right. But um, even the Suffolk County PD with, you know, I mean, nowadays they've got a multi-billion dollar budget back then. You know, I don't imagine them um, being, you know, in lesser of a financial position. If so, it was minimally. I mean, it was a major metropolitan area. They had money, they had resources, but they still found a way to fuck this case up. And for weeks give statements to the media about how, well, this was satanic in nature. There's an element of a cult at play here. And then it was made all the more complicated when Casso committed suicide in jail uh, only 36 hours after he was arrested. And so you no longer had the person that was the subject of the conversation being able to I guess, speak for himself or explain what he had done. All they had was a written statement that he signed. A cop wrote it out based on what he said was Casso's testimony during questioning. Testimony that was not filmed, videotaped, or even audio recorded. So all we have to go on, you know, by, uh, regarding what Casso supposedly said is cops saying, trust me, bro, which is... Not a great fucking situation. And I also don't understand why something like that was allowed to happen. This was a major case. Again, it was the first murder in this community in nearly half a century. The international news media was descending on Northport. You think they would have had the budget at the Suffolk County Police Department for a fucking $20 Sears and Roebuck tape recorder to like, let's get this ironclad and have an audio recording of his confession. But nope, apparently not. That is shady as all get out, as I like to say, because it is one of those things where it's like you want this to be something that you are going to take to trial or you're going to have this confession and you're going to be able to just make him plea out. And mm -hmm. the fact that they let him one be in a cell by himself and commit suicide just goes to show you how little uh, experience they had in dealing with anybody that may be one suicidal or too involved in something so heinous as this type of murder. And he definitely had a history of suicide attempts and his family made the police, you know, they told them, they told them they, he, Casso's parents called the cops and said, he has tried to kill himself before and they did nothing about it. They put him on a quote unquote suicide watch, which basically amounted to, ah, uh, yeah, check on him once every 30 minutes. But one of the big revelations that um, I encountered while writing the book was I submitted a Freedom of Information Act request to the uh, New York State Correctional um, Organizations that handled that prison, well, not prison, that jail in Long Island in Riverhead, and uh, found out there was an internal investigation in the wake of him hanging himself with that bed sheet, and it turned out Oh, yeah, um, the corrections officers that were supposed to do his checks, uh, they forgot to check on him for like two hours. Epstein. And by the time that final report, which was all internal, by the time that final report was filed, it was 18 months after Casa was dead. The story was out of the news, so it was never made public. But yeah, they, they were culpable in that kid dying. He should have never been in a cell alone. He should have been at the very least in the, the medical. I was just going to say, why wouldn't the they put him in like a medical lockup? Like they have those in hospitals. Yeah. It's not 
Oh, wow. I mean, that like to me, that just reeks of, I mean, it almost, you know, not to sound conspiratorial or anything, but it does sound super sketchy. Like it is very sketchy. And I, I think uh, most of it boils down to that. They d- just did not give a fuck. You know, th- they all thought that this kid was garbage for good reasons. And I think they all took the attitude of, well, if he fucking kills himself, good riddance. And so they stuck him alone in a cell in the middle of the ward of the jail that was reserved for rapists and um, child molesters. So they were the ones that were banging on their cell doors that whole first night he was in, in jail saying, hang up, hang up. They goaded this guy into killing himself and he did. Wow. I mean, that is malpractice as far as the officers go. Definitely dereliction of duty. And I think you're right. I think they probably just let it happen because they were convinced that this kid was one, obviously a murderer, but two, some th- somehow associated with the devil. And mm. hey, pr- little prison justice uh, never hurt anybody, according to these, uh, you know. Pot- oh yeah, less paperwork for all of us. Yep, yep. Fresh fish, fresh fish. You know, it's um. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, it's, it's tragic because you see, uh, these two kids and their lives, obviously they're ruined. Um, you know, Ricky Castle's family. I mean, they weren't some shady group of people. I mean, his father was a teacher. His father was also a really big piece of shit though. Okay. Too. Well, like, there you go. I mean, like that was, that was one of the more startling things that I found in my research because all of the, the prior tellings of this story, whether it's the original newspaper coverage or the first book that was written about the case, which was an exploitation paperback written by this, this hack writer called David St. Clair, uh, the book was called Say You Love Satan, and it was very influential. Like it inspired like a whole bunch of movies and heavy metal bands. But David St. Clair was, again, just a total hack. Like to give you an idea of the kind of writer St. Clair was, some of his other titles, and I am not making this up. Anyone listening, you can go on Amazon right now or eBay and you can find these books. Like one of them was called how your psychic powers can make you rich. And he wrote a book about Brazilian voodoo, which does not exist. So he was one of those fucking writers. And in all of those in his book and in the other prior tellings, it was, oh, my God, what a horrible, tragic story. He came from, you know, this all American family, loving parents who tried to do everything for him. And all he cared about was Ozzy Osbourne and smoking dope. And then once I actually got to Northport and started interviewing people who knew the Cassos and, you know, uh, Ricky's friends and Ricky's therapist that he was going to, I, you know, and, and I even talked to Ricky's younger sister about this and she confirmed all of it. Ricky's father, Dick Casso, was a, a, a phenomenal piece of shit. All he cared about was, I want one of my four kids to become a star athlete because he had been an athlete in school. His father, Alfred Casso, had been a minor league baseball player that had some success in, I think, the 30s. So he was obsessed with, you know, oh, you know, my one boy, he's going to be the Johnny Unitas of the family. And when Ricky Casso no longer had an interest in football, his father just fucking flipped. I interviewed one person for the book in the film who told me he was just like, yeah, Ricky showed up to school one day with all these bruises all over his back and his sides. And I asked him, you know, what happened to you? And he said, my father beat me with a broomstick last night because I was late to football practice. So. That's the kind of father this kid had. And I'm not, ex- you know, excusing what Ricky did, but it is fundamental to understanding. Well, how does a kid that is born in like a quote unquote normal middle class home in suburban Long Island end up living in the woods like a feral child and eating PCP for breakfast to the point where he snaps and murders his friends, uh, murders a friend of his over I think it was like $50 worth of drugs. It was it was a negligible amount. And th- th- it becomes very apparent how something like that happens when you read about the level of child abuse that was present in the Casso home. And it's something that we see, um, 
you know, happening across the board with the bulk majority of these violent offenders um, going all the way up to serial killers. There is usually a level of parental or authoritarian abuse at a young age that, you know, this is all going into nature versus nurture, you know, whether this abuse caused the mental illness or brought out the genetic uh, predisposition to it. Um, you know, that's all up for debate, but the fact of the matter is, is the abuse was there. This, this was a guy who was raised by a man who, if he did not get what he wanted when he wanted it, he would be physically violent to the point where, uh, you know, I interviewed neighbors that said, oh yeah, we watched him throw Ricky through a screen door one day because he wouldn't get his hair cut. And his, you know, Ricky ran away and fled into the woods. And so Dick just went upstairs and took all of his clothes out of his drawer and cut it up with scissors on the front lawn while everybody watched him. But this was the 80s. So when you saw your neighbors doing shit like that, the attitude was, well, we better keep it to ourselves. This is this isn't any of our business. Right. So. You know, the, the the shit that he pulled back then with his son, if he did it today, he would be in jail. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's child but, abuse. I mean, 100 percent. Yeah. But of course, because Ricky killed himself within two days of being arrested, you know, none of that stuff came out until decades later because his parents had the opportunity to go to every reporter who would listen to them and control the narrative of no, no, we, we were always so supportive and loving of him and. You know, bubble. you've got his father in one, uh, I think it's like the New York Post. He's talking about, like, we always told Ricky that if he didn't want to be an All-American, that was fine as long as he kept his grades up. And that's just not true. This is a guy that beat his 12-year-old son with a wooden broomstick because he didn't want to go to football practice. You know what I mean? Right. Like, that's not a stable human being. No, it's not. And the fact that he was a teacher as well is kind of dis- disturbing to a degree because he's you know shaping the minds of the future of america and it's like this guy at home is a monster and yeah and i interviewed some of his students because he didn't teach locally he he taught in another town over in cold spring harbor and i interviewed some of his students and they were like he was fucking weird like oh. you know he would he would talk about like he'd be bragging to his his students about how hot his wife is and like he, they said that uh, after the murder, he held like a question and answer day in class. Like, all right, let's let's get it all out in the open. Ask me whatever you want to know about Ricky. You know, like weird shit like that. You know, really unprofessional, bizarre shit. That's weird, but I don't know. There's prob- that one doesn't isn't as weird to me as like um, just being an asshole and kicking the shit out of your kid and then, you know, making him move out and live in the woods basically with a bunch of uh, homeless people and uh, going down a path. And that was the other thing he lied about too. He, he always framed it in the media as Ricky ran away because he didn't want to listen to the rules. When everyone I talked to Ricky's friends, Ricky's uh, his therapist, um, all these people say, no, the father threw him out and he threw him out as young as like 13 and and again, this like you just said, he's living in the woods. He is stealing and selling drugs to be able to afford cheap bologna and Wonder Bread to eat next to a campfire on an old couch that he lugged in there that was being thrown away. Um, he's he's hanging around with mentally unstable homeless people that are influencing him to do absolutely horrible and terrifying things like robbing a grave. Yeah. And I'm not trying to take away Ricky's culpability in all of this, but it is not as simple or cut and dry as, oh, yeah, no, he was like this great kid, star of the football team. And then one day he smoked a joint, listened to Ozzy, and he went crazy. It's tragic. Like, no, that's not what fucking happened here. But that's the story that the media ran with for years. And it got roped into all the different satanic panic cases you know the ones you think about the daycare workers and the craziness mm-hmm. that they went through and all that stuff and, and basically it's all those uh you know what is the proper psychological term you know i guess uh I, i'm not gonna take you the mass delusion ma- of yeah it. <laughs> i mean mass hysteria i guess is is what yeah, it yeah. is but like it's it's the yeah 
yeah, it's basically like when the kids all start, one kid says it and then the next kid says it. And it's like, they're trying to like one up each other to a degree where they're at the point where they're flying these kids to Mexico and back all within the same time frame that these kids are supposed to be. Oh yeah. Watched. And the teacher flushed us down the toilet mm-hmm. and we went into the sewers and saw old grandma playing the piano. Like, yeah, th- that's fucking Lock them up. courtroom Lock testimony. Them up. <laughs> You know, that's why I, uh, I I got really pissed off when um, Mindhunter came out, because while they changed their names and everything, the, the characters are clearly based on John Douglas, Robert Ressler and Ann Burgess. Right. And they made Ann Burgess's character out to be like this, you know, like shining example of of a woman psychologist, you know, in this cutting edge field, you know, as a, almost like a role model. But she was one of the biggest purveyors of all this satanic panic bullshit back then. She caused a hell of a lot more damage than good. She was uh, testifying as a quote unquote um, expert witness no, in really? a lot of these daycare Satanism cases. Oh man. Yeah. She was into like a lot of that repressed memory shit. Oh, if memory yes, I, uh, yes. doesn't fail me. Yeah. Repressed. It's, it's, it's junk science, it's junk science. <laughs> and you know, I've always been open about my experiences with therapy. And I have always said that to my therapist, like, listen, I think when I started with you back in 89 or 90 or whatever it was, like the whole world of psychology was becoming more accepted. And then all of a sudden you have this mm-hmm. repressed memory shit that comes out and it's like everybody and their cousin now has a repressed memory of about being abused and you know somehow these parents are involved and it's basically they're just planting these memories in these people's heads and then whatever if they're hypnotized or whatever they wake up and they're like oh my god i was molested i mean i remember you know roseanne is no person of credibility but like even she came out with Mm -hmm. like oh yeah and it's just like well no wonder people don't take psychology seriously when this is the kind of crap that they're putting out there and putting it in the media and then like you just said ann burgess is an expert test you know expert witness in satanic panic it's that's called mass hysteria and it's not good for anybody because it doesn't ever get to the solution or get to the the root of the problem i mean we're really just yeah you're really just throwing stones into the lake and hoping something hits and pops up. It's just, it's fruitless. Yeah. And like, don't get me wrong. Like I'm sure her intentions were honorable. I'm sure she believed the Kool-Aid in all of this stuff back then, but she also played a role in getting innocent people imprisoned for years that were only, you know, thankfully set free. Um, I, I think it was like an appeals process with that one yes, family. I, I believe it was another one of those daycare things, yeah. but it's just like, it's disturbing, but Netflix is just like, Oh yeah, no, uh, we can really, uh, you know, and, and this sounds so jaded and I, and I don't want it to come off that way, but I know how these people operate where it's just like, Oh yeah, you know, we, we really need to get the female demographic in. So let's, let's re, configure her character into something more you know admirable when the 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 truth of the matter is is a lot of the work that amber just did is reprehensible and it really sucks i think they could have they could have found a better person to fill that role in their thing and it is a role like i remember after my first book came out there was interest from like travel channel or one of those or investigation discovery one of those types of things and they wanted me to do a screen test for some true crime show that they wanted to do and at the time i was young and dumb and i said yeah sure why not could be fun if you know if i don't get the part at least it'll be a fun story here we are with it um but uh i remember at the end of the screen test they were asking me they're like do you happen to know like like an alternative chick and i'm like what does that mean you know, like someone with like like a lot of tattoos and piercings and stuff. And I'm like, I, yeah, I know some people with tattoos and piercings. Who doesn't? Well, yeah. Let us know if you could think of like like a chick, you know, actor that would be like we think it would be good to pair you with one of those. And I'm like, why? Why is that? Well, uh, you know, our, our market research has shown that uh, that really worked for American pickers. <laughs> 
And I'm like, American Pickers is not a true crime show. Like, so it's it's all about like predetermined roles and trying to sell a product and eye candy and all that stuff. And Mindhunter was no exception to that. Yeah. So it's like, oh. it gets very frustrating seeing people that were, were hacks being turned into like, you know, borderline pop culture sort of icons through, you know, the deceptive presentation of true crime media. That's true. It's very true. And you, you know, I wonder why they did choose her, but it is interesting to think that when when this was originally created, Mindhunter, it was supposed to be a five season show. I mean, that was the way that it had been laid out, and mm-hmm. it was going to be you know overlooked by um, you know the Zodiac director, and like he was going to write at least the first episode of each season. And I wonder if they would have ever covered that aspect of it and maybe shown her in a different light because of that. You see, I'm, I'm not so certain. I'm not so certain like either was, because of the way there they... was a period of time where I thought like, Oh yeah, well maybe they would have delved into that in the final season as to like complete her arc or something like that. But you know, I, I was one of those people when I first saw Fincher's Zodiac, I thought like, oh, my God, this is like the most accurate (laughs) true crime movie ever made. And then, like, you actually start doing some research into the Zodiac case. You find out Robert Graysmith was a total hack. (laughs) So that's a very, very interesting uh, subject, because I think Zodiac, you're right. It is one of the best. It's one of the best true crime movies but it's not accurate because it's all based off of one person's perspective that wasn't really mm-hmm. even involved that much with the case. He was the cartoonist. That is correct. But Graysmith, as we've seen since then, a lot of the stuff that he wrote in that book has come back, like you just said, isn't accurate. And it's total bullshit. Like you see all these documentaries that he pops up in and he's got this one quote that he loves saying. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this or heard about this, but you can you can set your watch to it. If Graysmith shows up in a Zodiac documentary, he is going to say, you know, Zodiac, you know, he called this his game of outdoor chess. There is not a single Zodiac letter, authentic or fake or subjective, where that phrase is uttered. It was not uttered during any of Zodiac's phone calls to the police or to the press. No one knows where that fucking phrase came from because the only person that ever talks about it is Robert Graysmith. There's also like a really funny thing um, in his uh, book. The epigraph to the book um, is a quote that says, we have madmen waiting. And he attributes the quotes to Middle Eastern terrorist 1979 or something like that. And when I was a kid and I read that quote, it scared the shit out of me. Like, oh, my God, there's like a, this was before 9-11 when I read that book. So like everything we knew about Middle Eastern ter- uh, terrorism was sort of like shrouded in mystery still. Mm-hmm. And it was just the idea of, oh, my God, there's these terrorists that are hiding out in the in the uh you know, in where in the Middle East, wherever, and they're recruiting psychopaths like that's so scary. And then I went and looked that phrase up in a newspaper archive many, many years mm-hmm. later, and I found out that the, the terrorist wasn't Middle Eastern at all. He was a black Muslim from like Philadelphia. Oh, he was part of the mo- part of the move movement. Yeah, something like that. I, I can't remember his name house. offhand. <laughs> Yeah, but 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 that's like a a really good example of the type of journalist that Graysmith was. It was he saw a name that, you know, obviously was Muslim sounding. And instead of attributing that quote under that name or looking a little more into it, he just went, ah, sounds Middle Eastern. I'm just going to write Middle Eastern terrorist when it was a dude from, again, I believe was Philadelphia. Jesse, it looks like we are running out of time this week, but I have to say thank you for joining Who Killed once again, and uh, it's always been a pleasure to have you on. Well, thanks for having me, and uh, you know, I'm sure we'll pick this up next week because we, we've unpacked a lot. I think we're making some progress with these revelations, as they say in therapy, and uh, hopefully um, everyone who tuned in this week will pop on by next week for the conclusion of this conversation, because, you know, I do think we're talking about 
things that need to be explored more here. The, the, the sort of the, the genesis or catalyst of the social phenomenons that influence the realm of criminology and true crime reporting. And just like the last time we spoke, anytime the ethics of true crime can be highlighted and discussed, it's important because a lot of true crime media is seriously lacking in it. And that is that's a fact. And uh, I like it when you come on and you provide the clarity that you do. You're very concise. Well, well, thanks for having me on for it. It's it's always uh, refreshing to be able to talk frankly about this stuff because, uh, you know, as much as I do, um, I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but as much as I engage in calling out this shitty behavior, I'm not exactly doing it just for because I think burning bridges is fun. It's just like, come on, you know, we, we all have to do better when it comes to the way that people engage in true crime um, consumption, I guess is, is one way to describe it because it is a, it's, it's a cottage industry now. I mean, it's wild. You look back 12 years ago, there was no true crime channel. Now there's five of them. Right. So it's wild. But then again, that is like what you said, it is a cottage industry and it is definitely taken on a life of its own. And it's the bread and butter for a lot of people in business suits everywhere. <laughs> this is true. So Jesse, thanks again, man. Hey, thank you. See you all next week. Next week. Till then. Thanks so much to Jesse Pollock for joining us this week in the Who Killed studio to discuss the satanic panic of the 1980s. He is definitely a great resource about that era, and he has researched it for many, many years. So, again, big props to Jesse for making time for our show, and I hope you guys enjoyed listening to his insight on the case and just the overall tenor of the environment of the 1980s and the different satanic issues that were brought to the forefront and we're seeing it again repeated today but in different forms so be aware always check twice and uh, make sure you're reading both sources and otherwise you may end up thinking one thing when it's completely the opposite so thanks again for listening this week join me next week for part two with jesse you can follow me on Twitter at Bill Huffman 3 I am very opinionated, and it is something that you can check out or not, and I, that's fine with me. So, again, new episodes drop every Friday, and many props to one Jesse Pollock for joining me in the Who Killed studio. And as always, until next time, stay healthy and be safe. Hi, podcast listeners. I'm Carol Costello, a former CNN anchor and national correspondent. This January, I'm launching a podcast about one of the first cases I ever covered as a journalist. It's one that stuck with me all of these years, the one that buried itself under my skin and stayed put. It's a true crime series about an amazing woman named Phyllis Cottle who defied torture and death and brought a fierce rage to the quest to find her attacker. Carol Costello Presents Blind Rage is a production of Evergreen Podcasts and signature title of the Killer Podcast Network. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Discover more great true crime and paranormal programming at killerpodcast.com. Hi, I'm Sean McCabe. And I'm Carrie McCabe. We are, well, married, obviously, <laughs> but we're also obsessed with the darker side of things. True crime stories, alien abductions, poltergeists. If it leaves you scratching your head and keeping those lights on at night, we want to hear about it. That's why we host the podcast Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Every week, we bring our listeners a true story guaranteed to send chills down your spine, from history's most brutal serial killers to the mystery of spontaneous human combustion. Yep, lots of these stories leave unanswered questions behind, and you'll get to poke through the rubble of the evidence with a hardened skeptic and... Someone whose mind is more open to fun. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> You can find Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie wherever you get your podcasts and on social media at Ain't It Scary. Come play with us.